you're going to build a boat, How do you work out the boat you're going to build if you're going to build a boat? Probably the first thing you've got to do is find a designer that you're happy to work with. And in my case, it was Phil Morrison and he lived at Exmouth and he was local to me and he understood that I just wanted a line drawing and a very simple package. I didn't want to have loads of structural drawings and everything. He was just going to give me some lines. And I'd already been dealing with Phil in the past. So it was a natural thing to go to him to design the hull because I'm not a naval architect. The project began with somebody else as well and the idea was two boats to be built in parallel. So one boat was going to be built first and that was going to help finance me to build my own boat. So let's talk about my boat. The first thing that happens is you've got to decide on a budget. You've got to decide how much money you've got and whether you can afford it. And so 40 foot was sort of decided as the sort of limit to the finances and it was decided that 40 foot would be the length of a boat that would be okay for crossing oceans. You can do it in a 30 foot catamaran and obviously James Warham and all those people did it a long time and plenty of Warham catamarans and small catamarans across the ocean but we're thinking like 50, 40 feet is the, the sort of limit and uh, little Freudian slip there and they nearly said 50 feet which seems to be the the margin now but 50 foot is a massive boat I have to say that if you've got a 50 foot boat it's a big big boat and it requires a lot of finance to keep that boat on the water and running and so really realistically if you're just a dreamer like I am 40 foot yeah, can handle all the things, the, the sails aren't too big, the winches aren't too big, the anchor's not too big, so 40 foot seemed like a good cutoff. So the decision was made, let's make it 40 foot long. The other thing that we had to face was that we we're gonna keep it in a river that dries and therefore the boat has to sit on the ground. And um, when we were exploring the hull design, we did look at low aspect keel. In fact, it was looking like Phil was suggesting something like a dart on hull on the bottom but unfortunately with that what happens is when you dry out you sort of nose down and the problem with that is that you dry out quite a bit and you often sleeping on the boat and then if you dry out like that it's not exactly comfortable and we decided that we'd go for dagger boards which is we felt was more efficient rather than the low aspect keels and the low aspect keels, the thing about them is that they restrict your draft a bit. And as we were coming in the shallow estuary, it was thought that being able to retract everything and come into the shallow water was the best answer for us. And we're actually sitting on a nice sandy beach, so we're, we're okay for drying out and rocks and things not going through the bottom of the hull. So the decision is dagger boards and a 40 foot hull and then it was a time of the VSV power boats, the very slim power boats and everything. And I was quite keen to keep the waterline beam down so that we could end up with a very slippery hull. And the reason behind that is that if you keep the waterline beam down compared to the waterline length, then you end up cheating the laws of displacement. And it means that you're not governed by hull speed. You can make your boat go faster and that's illustrated by canoes and rain skiffs which are long thin narrow craft which can row faster you go faster in a canoe than theoretically you should the other important thing about it is that you have a fine entry and a good exit on the hull and so you want to be about six degrees at the bow and you want to be fine at the stern or you if you're having a wider stern you've got to be very careful when you do the rear and make a wide stern on the catamaran so that the water flows off nicely and you don't create a lot of turbulence at the back of the boat so when you're going along in light winds and everything you should be leaving a minimum weight behind you not creating a large weight and if you've got a large weight coming off the back of your hull that normally means that you're creating some wave drag. I think it was discovered in 1898 about wave drag of the hull and um, 
and it's still the theory is still used today so you want that fine entry and you want a fine exit and then you reduce the amount of drag on the hull and you go much quicker the problem with a narrow water line is that you can't carry a huge amount of load because as you do you slip deeper into the water so obviously displacement is quite important in a cruising boat because what do you want to do you want to be able to carry stuff and obviously if you want to carry a lot of stuff you start expanding that water line to be able to displace enough to put all the stuff on board if your boat is limited like ours is by this narrow water line you means you can't carry quite as much as you would if you had a big fatter hull if you've got a big fat white catamaran you are effectively two mono hulls strapped together and you have none of the advantages of the catamaran apart from stability etc because the catamaran is built around the narrow water line and the fact that the bow and the stern wave don't converge and basically drag you back and that means you can defy the physical restrictions of displacement. The next thing that you'll notice about this hull is that it's double-ended and um, this was really an idea that came from Phil and uh, Although it's double-ended, it's got asymmetric water lines, so the bow is thinner than the stern. And the, this gives us a very flat rocker profile and also increases our ability to carry load. There's not a, a lot of rocker because the stern of the boat is now the rudder as well. And this gives us the ability to increase the displacement without coming up and raising the rocker at the back of the boat. And then if you imagine, if I show you the hull like that, you can see that as you're trying to go to windward, this is now a big foil. And so the foil, you're pushing this foil sideways into the water, so it's actually giving you some lateral resistance as well, without the need for the dagger board yet. So the long, thin hull, with particularly in this shape, you can see it's a foil, and you're pushing it sideways through the water, and actually it's gonna give you lift to windward and stop you sliding sideways all the time. So the sort of deep V of the Warham hulls is where they, they're more V'd, but it's this, a similar principle. You're using the long thin hull gives you very good directional stability. So even when you're going downwind in waves and everything, this tapered area of the hull immerses into the wave better than the volume of the other the other boat so it's got quite small rudders and often the rudders are almost out of the water but because you've got this long thin hull and you haven't got the volume in the stern you got the boat tracks very well in waves particularly and so it's got benefits upwind and downwind the only disadvantage of course is it's not a very big voluminous area of, so displacement wise we have to be careful the other problem with the narrow water line is also obviously you would be restricted in your accommodation and to overcome that we put a chine into the hull and the reason for the chine is to expand so you walk around on the water line but higher up the boat you've got the width for bunks and the interior is bigger so you've got the narrow water line then you're expanding the width of the hull by using a chine the only thing that you've got to be careful with is that you don't have a huge amount of volume to the chine in the bow area because as the boat pitches down, if you've got a, a wide chine here, immediately the volume of the hull increases massively. So it doesn't matter if you put a reverse bow on or whatever, if this area of the hull is expanding rapidly, you obviously as it immerses you're increasing the volume of the hull enormously and you can get the chine often can slam in that area now the other important thing when you're looking at chines is you've got to keep a sharp edge on that so that when the boat goes down the water releases off the side of it now anybody who's a surfer will know where you have a soft rail so the soft rail immerses itself and the water wraps around the rail and holds the board into the face of the wave. As you come to the tail of the surfboard, you've got the very sharp rail and that releases the water. And so the same thing with here, what you're trying to do is as the boat plunges down, the sharp edge of the chine is gonna shoot the water away from the hull and stop you getting wet on board. There's no need to get soaking wet. You're cruising after all, you've got your family, you've got all your stuff on the boat. So we've arrived at this hull, it had the 
we got the accommodation and volume that we needed in the hull, we had the narrow water line, and then we had the hull that could sit on the beach. And that is really the start of the design. So you've got the hull shape, and then you've got to decide on how you're going to construct it.